Seven hundred. That's a seventy-five thousand dollar jump. Do you think he's serious? I think he wants the car, don't you? They bid against it. Goes seven twenty-five. How shall I say this? I am impressed with his sincerity. Both. What a bummer to jump at seventy seventy-five thousand dollars. Have the other guy say, "Okay, fine, twenty-five thousand more for me." <laughs> Where does it end? He's, he's putting in the deed to his house now. No, he's not sure. Is it to me? Yeah, why not? Yeah, why? And he says, me too. Yeah. Don't you wonder what mousetrap the gentleman invented? Oh. <laughs> we got 6,000 people coming to the <laughs> I tell you what, I'm coming to my feet. 900,000. Oh. $900,000. $925,000. dollars The whole place is on its feet. Except for that guy. <laughs> Who may wind up owning this car. A million dollar Chevelle. One million. He's just raised it. Just the raised it. You know the headline from the magazines, gentlemen? Beyond belief. You know, guys aren't used to spending a million and not getting their way. <laughs> and we're arguing in hundred thousand dollar increments. Finished. Oh, we're down to fifty thousand dollar increments. <laughs> Standing O at $1.15 million for that historic 70 Chevelle LS6 convertible race car. Mike. Ray Allen is standing up here sweating with me. Can you believe it? I can at a certain point. I knew it was going to go for a lot of money. I didn't think it would go for that much. I figured around seven, eight hundred. Now let me ask you, back in the day, how much did you earn racing this car? How much did I earn racing the car? I, I couldn't remember that. I don't know. Nothing close to that? No, we won about 40000 within three weeks. Wow. Yeah. A great car, yeah. and good Thank to see you. it go like this. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, even in 1970 dollars, that's a long way to come. Talk about beating the stock market to death. 1.15 mil. Let's all take a deep breath and come right. And more to come. Boy, oh boy. I'm still thinking about that drag racer. It was followed across the block by a Dodge Hemi Coronet RT convertible, which went for the better part of $300,000 and hardly raised a ripple in the crowd. Right now, we've got a 1962 Dodge Dart 440 Max Wedge two door hardtop, lot 1288.1. The bidding stands at $140,000. And there's a lot of uh, confusion. The nomenclature Dart 440 has nothing to do with the engine. This is actually a 413 Max Wedge, low compression version, with 11 to 1 compression and 410 horsepower. It's a very special car, one of very few that were built without the filler coupe. It's a hard top. The car was designed the week the stylus stayed home. This was not a pretty car. Look at the front end of this. Good grief. What were they thinking? Well, you know, that's the work of Virgil Exner right there, the same guy who did the De Elegance that we'll see later on today. Go figure. Everybody has a bad day, and uh, I think this was one of them, too, but really successful drag racer, and, and this car is nicely trimmed out. I like it. And I like what's coming up next, too. 162.5. Big spirited bidding here, 165. 165. Just a few days ago, that would have made our eyes pop. It's amazing how the market changes not only when Barrett Jackson is done, Keith Martin, but during 
the auction itself. We have an email here from John Boyle in Spokane. And we'll get to it in just a second. Here, that car is selling at 165000 Wait, uh, John Boyle asks, could you discuss whether the Barrett-Jackson bump will apply to viewers with similar cars? Or is the atmosphere of Barrett-Jackson, the national television Scottsdale competitive bidders, unique? That's a question that all of we analysts wrestle with all year long, and certainly the owners of cars do too. You know, that, that LS6 sell for a million two, does that make yours with non-race history worth a million? Probably not. I would say that the prices at Barrett-Jackson, they establish a high watermark, but they bring, the, the magic of Barrett-Jackson is bringing all these bidders together. If, a, if you're advertising your car for sale in Spokane, for instance, it's going to be hard for you to get the same kind of national reach and get the same mm -hmm. kind of motivated, qualified buyers to come together in one place. So I, I think these are, these are real prices and the cars are worth what they're bringing, but they're hard prices to replicate outside of this arena. I look forward to the issue of Sports Car Market and Magazine in which you're going to have to tear all this apart and make some sense of it, Keith. Here's a 65 Shelby GT350 Fastback, and we're at 240,000 and climbing. Now, there are a lot of people that, that feel, and I am one of them, that the 65, the first, is still the best and the purest of all the Shelby Mustangs. He only made 562 of them. Uh, the only thing that could make this better is if it were what they call a, a double-digit car, in other words, made within the first uh, 100 units of production, or if it were one of the super rare R models. Other than that, it's got everything going for it. It's a Shelby. It's the right year. It looks to be in fabulous condition. We're approaching a quarter of a million bucks. And uh, guys, what are you seeing down there with it? Well, these were brutal cars. The 65 was, by all means, the most brutal. It still has the drive shaft loop, the one known the year for it. The side engine exhaust with glass pack mufflers and radio lead. This one restored. It's got a list of show awards as long as your arm. Wow, somebody just went for the big TKO. I was going to say, fasten your seatbelts, guys. This car is going to go strong. These are rare and very desirable Shelby Mustangs. From the real deal. Five to 300. Now back to 275. Miscommunication there. Now to 285. We're going to get to 300 anyhow. Three. There you go. We'll do it that way. It's about six years ago I watched a 350H sell at an auction in Portland for about $38,000, $40,000. We all thought that was too much money. <laughs> this is why we're here, folks. To make ourselves feel bad about all the bad decisions we've made all our lives up until this point when it comes to cars. Uh, I just, I love this. It's hard to describe. You have to come here and see this in person. But if you were of driving age in 1965 or close to driving age, this was one of the two or three cars you dearly lusted after. We're going to pause at 311. Now, the 66 looks very similar, but it's the one that had those vent windows in it. It wasn't nearly as raw a car. They made about 10 times as many. Uh, if you really want Shelby specialness, this is it. Sold at $311,000. Uh, frankly, I'm surprised that it's not more. I, I figured 250 to 300, and, and I'm not. Su I'm surprised it's not more. 76 cars have sold for more than $100,000 today. And now on the stage, lot 1294 is a 1963 Chevy Corvette Z06 Coupe. Now, this is really special stuff here. 1963, the first year for the Stingray Corvette body style, makes it a split window, of course. That was a one-year-only model. It's a Z06. There's only 199 of those built, and that was basically the factory version of the race car at that time. Uh, just had slightly different equipment specifications, so uh, really a, a double dip here. A split window and a Z06. We're at $110,000, $20,000 in climbing. Earlier, I was talking with Keith Martin. He wondered where the split windows were. There is one, Keith, and that's what it looked like as it rolled onto the stage from our camera on the block. 
Yeah, yeah these cars. These cars are pretty quickly. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, these cars are special. I mean, the Z06 is basically the road racing package. The funny thing is, the early versions of this, the photographs of them, show knockoff wheels. So those things never actually were released for the public. So the wire, excuse me, the, the full wheel cover is what you wound up with. They did come back for 64, but 63, a lot of those Z06s were shown with the knockoffs, but they did not make production. Saw the stickers from the drag races at Islip Speedway on Long Island, not far from where I grew up. The tires on this car are pretty neat. They are the original gum-dipped Firestone tires from 1963. You don't see many that well preserved. It's an older restoration done in 1980 or 81. However, it does have all the right stuff. Bloomington Gold certification, NCRS validation. It has also received a Duntoff Award, which means all the operational stuff is right. And the records also show that this is one of the very first cars to get a Muncie four-speed transmission. Previous to that time, the Saginaw T10 was the four-speed transmission. Muncie is a much stronger transmission, and it was served behind big blocks all through the 60s. It's gone before some very, very discerning panels of judges. And $183,000 takes it away. I will call that one well bought. It, it's a factory fuel. It's a split window. It's a factory and rare Z06, less than $200,000. That's a good buy. I just, I just talked to the seller. He said he paid $5,400 for it, brand new. Wow that thing up on the stage that would clear the block <laughs> no problem with too many bidders up there then one of the great historic stories here at barrett jackson i saw an email at speedtv.com said there may be as many as nine of those buses still in existence but that one is here and it is a beauty now on stage speaking of beauties lot 1295 is a 57 chevy corvette zl1 convertible Interesting in that this looks nice in stock, but you know the headlights are really new, so let's come around and see how stock it is. Oh, my gosh. Something uh, that Dr. Duntoff didn't intend in 1957. <laughs> That's right. Well, we all know that, of course, Duntoff was uh, adamantly against putting big blocks in his plastic wonder car because it would disturb the weight. Well, this is an all-aluminum ZL1 motor. Now, we talked about ZL1 Corvette earlier. That order would mean 1969 and one of two, but Chevrolet reintroduced the ZL1 name on a crate motor series. Only 200 made. This is number 178 of them, and they're all signatured and signed by GM. Well, people responding to this very tastefully done, beautiful Restomod, paying big money. Now, it's still a 57 Corvette. We're at a quarter of a million dollars already. 454 cubic inch ZL1 big block, aluminum as mentioned. Number 178 of 200, the engine that is, that will ever be produced, making 510 horsepower. A lot of detail in this car, a lot of expensive work, hand work. You're seeing TV screens and electronics and, of course, a special frame, all kinds of technology. But if you swap those wheels, it still looks pretty much like a 57 Corvette. Let's listen into the bidding. And once again, here's a, a bidder's assistant working two bidders. He may be down to one pretty quickly. Sold. $275,000. You have to think quickly. Be ready to commit. Rick DeBrul is out back. Mike Joy, Steve Bagnante down on the auction block. And on that block right now is a 1967 Shelby GT500 fastback. Numbers matching car. Steve, once again, if uh, or Mike, whoever's closest, if we could take a look and verify, do we have a 427 car or a 428 car in the 67 GT500? Well, this is it's, it's a 428 car. If it was a 427 car, it'd be one of a very few built, and you can bet the owner would be making a big deal out of that. But still, it is a dual quad car, and a pair of 660 CFM Hollies on there. Beautiful looking engine, potent engine too. Now this car here, it's kind of cool. A lot of documentation comes with it, including an original owner's manual for Shelby GT350 or 500 Mustang. When's the last time you saw one of those? Three-owner car. 
Now, Brittany Blue is considered one of those Susie Secretary colors, especially with the parchment interior. Uh, I don't recall seeing many of these on the Ford muscle cars. It's attractive, but it sure is a different look than the bullet green or black. I see inside of the car, of course, we have the, uh, the roll bar that was part of the Shelby package. It's right in place where it needs to be. And, of course, the shoulder harnesses, factory stuff with retractable uppers, all functional, all present. Nothing, none of this stuff was removed and thrown away over the years. Very nicely restored and preserved. I agree with you. It's a subtle, if perhaps a, uh, an unusual com a color combination, but attractive. This one also has the original Kelsey Hayes Magstar wheels. And again, just to clarify the powertrain, this is a dual quad 428 four speed car. And, and speaking of wheels, you guys, in the trunk here, the owner says we have the original spare tire. It has some use on it, but that is the tire that came on this car at some point in its life. 220, James Air, 220, 230. Out of the 220, we get 30. Is everybody done? Out of the 220, we get 30. Is everybody through? Out of the 220, we get 30. The hammer's up. Out of the 220, we get 30. Sold. 220. There it goes for $220,000. Very nice gesture. Well bought. We'll take another bill. Now rolling up. 67 Chevy Corvette, another 427, 435 horsepower convertible. A Copo car, we are told, known as the Brass Hat. Well, Brass Hat was a term for a car that was ordered by a GM executive. And this car appears to have original paint on the hood. You can see a little bit of spider web cracking that's typical of fiberglass. But I'd rather see that than an unsympathetic repaint. Uh, somebody has taken very good car, care of this car, and it is described as an unrestored benchmark award winner. And nicely so. I'm kind of glad they didn't try to redo this car. Looks great just the way it is for its age. I agree with you, Mike. There, uh, The information we have says this car has 50 thousand miles on it it's uh won the bloomington gold certification so it's right it's a uh, very legitimate piece this lindale blue combination with a white top uh, already at uh, one hundred forty thousand dollars, and look what's sitting right behind it you know, what, they, what they say is you talk about car can be restored many many times but it can only be original once and so this is a chance to own a car a fifty thousand mile used car that has not been improved or changed or altered. That's yeah. owning a clear and significant piece and of history. And not just any used car, but a 67, 427, 435 rag top to boot. We even know the name of the brass hat who ordered it. He was the manager of the St. Louis plant. His name was Louis Biscotch. It says here that this, uh, the engine was ordered with a cylinder conditioning treatment, which means it was balanced and blueprinted at the factory and to produce over 500 horsepower. I'm going to say, guys, you talk about self-restraint. How could you own this car and only put 50,000 miles on it? You know, I mean, hooray, hooray. But it's a time capsule. This truly is a snapshot. It's a time machine. Blueprinted would mean that it was very carefully treated to bring it to the precise engineer specifications. A well manicured engine, in other words. You're trying to be two? We're at $200,000. But you can see a lot of the bidders can't help looking to the left to the next car in line. That Forest Green Pontiac Bonneville concept car. I'll take 200 on the stage, sir. 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 I'll take 200 on Okay, thank you. Two hundred and ten. So right over here. $200, Sold for two hundred thousand dollars. I think that's a deal. Yeah. Nice piece of automotive history on its way, and now we turn block. And Bob Varsh is roaming the building with Matt Stone. Now, you've seen Bill Goldberg earlier. We're going to sell one of his cars, a 1970 Plymouth Cuda, 383, 335 horse, V8 four-speed. Pretty car. And uh, I think Bill's going to muscle his way through the crowd, which should not be any problem, and talk to us about this. 
Yeah, it's, a, it's a nice car, guys. Four-speed car with arms like that. I bet you can power shift this thing like mad. Microphone number two. Please. Bill, you can't afford a gallon of gas for the car. You know you got to take a shot for this one. It would only be Bill Goldberg that would run out of gas driving up on stage, but I got the, the, the Mopar guru to vouch for me that everything's cool with that car. I just, uh, you know, uh, uh, these guys just were having fun with it in the back. You know, hey, I ran out of gas. What it the hell? It was our first date. It was Galen and I's first date, and uh, I just wanted to stop short on him, so hey. <laughs> Let's sell this car. And he'll go and have Galen Govier is Dr. D code for these Mopars. He is the authority as to what is right about these cars. Yeah, this is interesting. At most auctions, this car could be a highlight or a centerpiece. It's a rare car because it's a 70 Cuda convertible. It's got a four speed. It's documented. It's in excellent shape. But at the Barrett Jackson, where it takes four or five hundred thousand dollars to even get mentioned on the screen, it's just kind of a curiosity to see. Gee, how much will a nice 383 bring when it's got a, an ex-wrestler in its provenance? Well, I gotta say, speaking of Galen Gover, it's a, he, he does a service where he'll fly to your home, he will document your car, he'll actually make a list of things that are correct and things that are incorrect, and that is actually the gospel. Galen's been at this for about 25 years, and he is the authority on unusual variances, production codes, all that stuff. And to have him verify your car, it's like money in a bank. Now, Bill Goldberg is a very knowledgeable enthusiast. He doesn't buy junk, and we want to show you the undercarriage as this rolled up on the block. Very pristine. Uh, I don't think he's driven this car much, Keith. Which may be to the benefit of the car, actually. I mean, as, as uh, Stephen was saying, if he wanted to power shift this car, he could probably reach into the tranny with his fist and skip the shifter <laughs> altogether. Now, under the hood, we do see a couple of light modifications. Of course, we have ceramic-coated headers here, but in the trunk are the factory exhaust manifolds. So he's aware of the car's value and its originality, but he likes to get a little more power out of the car, and headers help that, for sure. This looks like strong money for a 383. We haven't seen another one today, have we? Have we seen any other Cuda convertibles or Challenger convertibles today? I don't think so. But the 383 cars typically, yeah, they're not the, the shining stars by any stretch. But it's a drop top, and this is 2006, and who knows where these things are going. And it's numbers matching, so it's a real car. It is what it is. And it's a drive it today, no questions, no excuses. You don't have to do anything to it. Fulfill your fantasy, put the car in the garage, be happy. The painted Endura bumpers, uh, this is a pretty highly optioned car. The 383 was no stone. It was a high torque motor. It would get you down the road in a good hurry. That's right, yeah, 425 foot pounds. Oh, it's about to go. Here we go, Ladies and gentlemen, don't slow down, They're letting the auctioneer catches breath let the bidder sit there and think about it can i just put another five grand am i going to lose the car i've come to 150 am i going to lose the car billy gibbons from zz top talking it up with bill goldberg yeah see we, we bumped it up yeah. the auctioneer is no one to stop one seventy, one seventy, one hundred and seventy. I have so one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Thank you. Pretty car, pretty car, and a happy, uh, happy new owner. Okay, now coming up next is for me the giant mystery of this auction. Will it bring 600,000? Will it bring 3 million? Why don't you? That's a record. Thinking of the seller, he was hoping for 600,000. Can you imagine how he feels right now? He's got an extra 3.4 million dollars to figure out what to do with. 
I got a feeling that's not going to the coach lot at Daytona. <laughs> Another nice. Steve, this car should make folks snap right back to attention. A Plymouth Hemi Cuda convertible. That's right, guys. It's one of 14 built in 1970. Now, there are actually fewer than these built in 71. That's the one that's going to be astonishing. But still, this car is going to get some fat numbers probably right now. It's an automatic 727 torque flight car, and it has the uh, track pack with a 354 gear Dana 60 rear axle. The Dana, of course, for this year, was upgraded to 35 spline axles, which makes it indestructible. But it's a numbers matching, real deal Hemi Cuda convertible. We're told this is the only one built in 1970 in high impact vitamin C orange. So as one of one, is this a seven figure car, Keith? Well, it's really one of 14. I mean, you have to okay. decide how far you want to parse it. Right. Um, uh, well, it's 900,000 right now, so I'll, I'll, I'll be real risky here and say, yeah, I think it's going to be there or close. How's that, Mike? Well, just remember, I asked you the question when it was at 7. <laughs> yeah, that was 30 yeah. seconds ago. It's going, and it's going up there quickly. For people who don't believe that muscle cars are million-dollar cars, we've proven it tonight, haven't we? Well, they call it vitamin C orange, but it's also known as Hemi orange. So there's a connection between the color and the engine, which is also painted Hemi orange. And it's also a connection with at least two bidders because they're just shy of a million bucks. It's uh, according to the documentation on this car, too. They say this is the only vitamin C Hemi Cuda convertible done in 1970. So it's one of one when it comes down to its colors. It's an automatic, interestingly enough. I wonder how many of these were four speeds. You know, I'm not sure of that number, but inside the car, we see a little red badge. That's the carb air. That thing right there is your manual pull switch or pull, pull, pull handle to open or close the air grabber. It's worth a million now, isn't it? It's a hard choice once you get to two commas in the number. But you know, everybody who's bidding at this level can afford to pay that. It's just how much they want to pay. It's not a question of can they, it's will they. Last shot, folks. Last shot. Rare Plymouth Hemi Cuda two-door. Documented, fully documented, listed in the Chrysler registry. Last chance for this one. Out of a million two for dead, out of a million two, roll it away, out of a million two, turn high, out of a million two, turn high, 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 million two, million two, million two, now three, million three, million two, fifty, million three, 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 million At the rear four. of the car, we million see the beautiful three, Cuda four. emblem three, million four. and the through the balance dual exhaust tips. It's just a beautiful feature of these cars. These cars have serious presence. It's an interesting point, Steve. You could buy a Barracuda in 1970. You could buy like a Grand Coupe, the one with the vinyl top and all that. But when you got the apostrophe Cuda, that was the muscle machine. That's correct. The Barracuda was available with a 340 or a 334 barrel. That's as good as it got. Of course, the 340 Barracuda is a very very rare car. Very few were ordered. Most guys went right for the throat and bought the Cuda, which came with big brakes, big suspension. But yeah, there's a difference between a Barracuda and a Cuda. Look how quiet this guy is as he raises his bid. Yes, look at that little nod like you and I take some coffee. One million seven. I'll pay a million one six. Million seven. Yep. Let's try it one more time, please. One million seven. I think we're getting close to market price now. One million six. One million seven. 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 One million seven.
one of 14. Very rare one of these comes up for sale. Keep going on. Nine you can't escape the rarity right or the performance now, two million, two. of this million, automobile. Million, it's million, it's the million, pinnacle million, of million, open million, top million, Chrysler million, cars. Million, two. I understand that this bidder was sitting next to the fellow that bought the LS6. So maybe their buddies just came here to drop five or six mil. The guy that bought the LS6 was the underbidder on the future round of bus. One million nine. One million nine. One million nine. We're getting there, aren't we? There he is. That's the fellow that bought the LS6. Now two million dollars down. I have the same T-shirt. Now at some point, Keith, do you start thinking? Do you start thinking? If, if that's your ask, yes. at some point you start thinking. Yeah. If I spend this money, am I going to drive it? Am I going to park it? What am I going to do? If you've got two million to spend, you do whatever you want. That's like where does a thousand pound gorilla sleep? Anywhere he wants. <laughs> exactly. He does. Now he's getting into the show. Big smile, holds up. Two fingers, let's go for two. Or as Ernie Banks used to say, let's play two. This is the only true reality TV you'll ever see. This is happening real time right in front of us. People spending $2 million for a car. $2 million, $2 million, one third and last call. Two million, nine million, nine million, third and last call. Ladies and gentlemen, all at once, everybody scream so. Ready? So two. Did you ask me if I thought it'd get to a million? He had a smile on his face when he said two, and that may have cinched it. Someday, when our kids are old enough to drive, they may consider that car well bought. Very special. 53 Chevrolet Corvette number 003. It's the oldest survivor of the serial production 53 model run. In other words, there may have been a prototype car or something that still exists, but if the, once they started the production line running, this is the oldest and it's documented to be that. So it's really the Adam of the clan of the serious of the serial production Corvettes. How much is it worth? Well, we're already at six hundred thousand dollars. Well, this car, if it was restored sixteen years ago in 1990, when the state of the art may not have been what it is today, but it has held up very nicely. The Blue Flame Six is there. All three two barrel cabinets are there. It's, it's a really, really beautiful car. Bloomington Gold Award, Corvette Hall of Fame. Excuse me, guys, those are one barrel carburetors. Keep those emails. You ask, would you drive it or show it? Or This one, there's no question. This is a yeah. museum car. You can't drive this. You could, but it would be a shame. It would be wrong. And notice the wheel covers on this car are quite a bit different from what you're used to seeing on a 53, 54 Corvette. These are what the very earliest cars wore, kind of a sombrero smooth wheel cover. Of course, these cars were hindered by their cast iron two speed power glide automatic. But as I've said before, at least the GM engineers did recalibrate it to upshift from first into second or drive at 55 miles an hour instead of 45. To Steve, get a little better acceleration. Steve, they're not hindered anymore. Nope. The collected car market is speaking. Can you imagine what this car must have looked like going down the road in 1953? It was one of only a couple fiberglass bodied cars that were available. It was one of very few two seaters on the road post World War II. And it was so weird and undesirable that they were only able to get 300 of them off the showroom floor. Uh -oh. 
850. Ooh, 925. That's Dana Meekum, who uh, owns an auction company, sitting there in the pink hat. And this early car was hand assembled at the GM assembly line. Dana is out. He'd actually, the 53s sold out pretty quickly because they all went to VIPs, people who wanted to be first. A lot of the public complained they couldn't get a 53 as we go to a million dollars. So Chevy really ramped up production for 1954 so the public could buy Corvettes. Are you done? Are you sure? Ladies and gentlemen, give him a hand. So, Dave Wrestler, one million dollars. Another million dollar car. I love this guy. Well, thanks again to Mr. Roy Slinger for taking time to be with us to comment. And very appropriately so. Rick? It is time for our next Haggerty Fantasy bid car, and this time we're going to the top. We're going to the king. It is. We've got another prototype car here, a true prototype concept car, a 1964 Pontiac Banshee XP833 Coupe. Uh, what we're told is that John DeLorean mentioned this car and that GM ultimately felt it was too big a threat to the Corvette and killed it. I gotta say, I look Steve. at this car from the front, I'm seeing Opel GT style and Qs, Corvette Stingray 68 up style and Qs. This car has a lot of things, and you can bet those other cars borrowed from this one, because this one came first in 64. This is a car that probably should have made it to market. Pontiac's overhead cam six was a strong motor. The car was very lightweight, and it would have sold at a price point underneath the Corvette, and they could have, would have, should have. It, one interesting detail, too, is this one has an overhead cam Pontiac 6, which wasn't released for production until the 65 model year. I'd love to get this motor out of this car and see if it's maybe an experimental or an early engine or something. One thing, too, though, it is a one-barrel version of that engine. As we all know, there's a Sprint four-barrel version available. I wonder why they didn't select, well, the more exciting four-barrel for this exciting car. Because the, the, the taillights on the back look like the... Uh, the Firebird tail, uh, tail lights from the uh, 70s. Look at that. Yeah, a lot of the styling cues on this car made it to production in other cars. In other cars. You know, I gotta say something, guys. I took a peek underneath this and it has basically a standard Salisbury type Pontiac 10 bolt rear axle, foil springs in the back, but the framework looks like it was flame cut. It's, it's not rude or crude, but it was definitely not made to be looked at underneath. Seems like a bargain after a $4 million dollar bus. Yeah. This is another iconic car that wouldn't matter if it had Fred Flintstone drive. If you remember it from the car shows, you want it. One last thing, guys, before we close the hoods. See here, the heater must have been leaking because it's been capped off. Mm. I'm going to have been 195 on the internet, now 200,000. I'm going to have been 195, I'm going to have been two. I'm going to have been 195, I'm going to have been two. I'm going to have been 195, I'm going to have been two. Tim, what's he say? I'm going to have been Tim. I've got to go. I got 195 on the internet. I'm going to go 200,000. He says it's all done. I'm going to have been 195, I'm going to have been two, two, two. All done. All through. The internet's in at 195, I'm going to have been two. Sold for 195 on the internet. It's a significant car, and I've yeah. 195,000 bucks. You could come to any event in the world with that car and be welcome. I, well bought. I think that is cheap. cheap. Well bought. Just a session, and eight hours into our speed coverage of the world's greatest collector car auction. And man, have we seen some action tonight. Five cars have sold for over a million dollars. Records have been shattered. Right now, we're looking at a very interesting. 1995 low-tech C1000 race car. It's one of one, the only one in the world. A unique story. According to the information we have here, this was built and commissioned by a United Arab Emirates citizen who desired to own simply the fastest car in the world. It's about ready to sell. No, they're going to talk about it a little bit, as will we. It's got a Mercedes emblem on the front, and that's because uh, the, the gentleman who had it built contracted Mercedes, who then contacted or contracted with Lotech for the body design, 
It's got a carbon fiber body. It's got a thousand horsepower with an engine by Mercedes. Twin turbo 5.6 liter Mercedes Benz V8. Hewlin five speed racing transaxle. Brakes, lots of carbon fiber, all sorts of aerospace materials. Truly a unique piece. And a, and a total cost of $2,200,000 to build this one car, which is sold on a bill of sale, not even a title. Well, it certainly packs the performance. 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds. 0 to 125 miles an hour in 8 seconds. Top speed claimed to be 268 miles an hour. Imagine pulling up for a smog test in that. Yeah, or just going to the DMV to, to get a title. Well, that's, again, why it is sold on bill of sale only. Well, when I saw the Mercedes logo and the silver, it reminded me a lot of the old Sauber sports yeah, cars. Exactly. Which also had that C designation for Peter Sauber's wife. $250,000 takes home that one-of-a-kind sports racing car. Begging your pardon, 225. Our computer was getting ahead of itself, listening to the auctioneer rather than looking for those hands to get in the air. And a big cheer from the crowd and the prices that it brings. Here comes a 1970 Pontiac GTO Judd, Judge Hardtop. A lot of 70s GM muscle going across right now. This one, very rare color combination. And I think that's right for the judge. These reds and oranges like that. Uh, this one has a full Pontiac historical services documentation. And it's a four-speed car with factory air. I don't believe I've ever seen one in orbit orange. In, uh it looks really good on this car, course. I love the 70 of the second generation GTOs. The 70 is my favorite. And uh, this one shows a little evidence of being driven under hood, but otherwise uh, nicely restored. And the paint quality is very nice. And there's a whole book of paperwork with this car, including a repro window sticker that indicates it went out the door brand new for $4,521. Seller calls this the rarest of all judge colors. Well, another thing that makes this rare is in 1970, we've talked about it before, GM was allowed to put in uh, big block motors, 455s. However, this one has the Ram Air 3. It's only a 400. We're going to see it roll across our chassis cam right now. And um, I would agree that a Ram Air 3 with a four-speed is a very, very nice powertrain combination. Looks good, clean, and honest underneath, too. Yeah, the Enduraflex nose cap is in wonderful shape. There's no evidence that it's ever been whacked and repaired. You usually see that as, as bubbling. And it's a lot of work to get one of these things right when it's been ruined. Right to the right. The same is right. Everybody away there's Jim. We've seen some pretty impressive panel work on these cars throughout the auction. This uh, this is way better than new, and, and there's the ongoing debate. Do you just restore a car to as-built condition, or do you make it better than new and make it a showpiece? There's, there, I think there's a nice spot somewhere right in the middle of all that that this car falls into. It's not a show car, but it's better than a driver, and it's better than new. One thing I'm seeing here that I like, again, is the correct judge wheels. These are 14 inches, but they do not have trim rings on them. That is correct for the judge. Five in the back. You said 55 is my bid over here, correct? Now 60. 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 Now 60.
70 pound, 100 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 pound, 70, now 75, 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 now 75
potential $600,000. There she goes. I really appreciate the seller on that being so forthright in their description. It obviously didn't hurt the value of the car. The new owner was bidding on the car, knowing everything about it, and everybody's happy. So the, really the message for sellers is whatever there is about the car. Okay, do we have more big bucks rolling up? Lot 1324, a 1970 Plymouth Hemi Cuda hardtop, triple black. Super track pack car. This would be the most sinister car on the street. Whether it's the Berlin Turnpike, where we used to <clears throat> drag race on Saturday nights, or any Main Street anywhere in USA. You'd pull up alongside this car, you'd know it's sinister, then you see the scoop poking out of the hood and that legend, Hemi Cuda, and you might think twice about running this thing down to the next traffic light. No, nah, this is cool, Mike. Numbers matching, track pack car, four-speed car, original Hemi, triple black. I'm there. I, I like this car. Window sticker, owner's manual, receipts to past owners, documented by guru Galen Govier, certified by him with a visual uh, and hands-on inspection. So once again, like so many of the big buck cars at Barrett-Jackson, this seller has done all of his work to bring you top dollar and to make the bidders feel comfortable that if they're springing for big bucks, they're going to get exactly what they think they are. And Matt, uh, what I'm saying is I love the car, but if I pulled up next to it on a Saturday night, I would not want to race against it. 350,000. I'm gonna be three seventy five and a bit four. I'm gonna be three seventy five and a bit four. I'm gonna be four and a quarter, four and a quarter, four twenty-five top. I'm gonna be four twenty-five. I'm gonna be four twenty-five. I'm gonna be four four twenty-five. Four fifty, four fifty, four fifty, four fifty. I'm gonna be twenty-five fifty. I'm gonna be four and a quarter, four and a half. I'm gonna be four and a quarter, four and a half. I'm gonna be seventy-five. I'm gonna be four seventy-five. I'm gonna be four seventy-five. Put the picture down. I'm gonna be four seventy-five. I'm gonna be four and a half and a bit seventy-five. I'm gonna be four seventy-five and a bit five. I'm gonna be five, 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 give me five. I'm gonna be four seventy-five and a bit five hundred. I'm gonna be five and a quarter, five and a quarter, five and a quarter. What you say? I'm gonna be five, five, five and a quarter. I'm gonna be five, five, five and a quarter. Last shot. Registered as number 128 of the 28470 Hemi Cudas built with four speeds and hardly Jonah any hand. Triple black. Bring the bid to five hundred ten thousand dollars. Five twenty. Five twenty. Five twenty. Five twenty. Five thirty. At five twenty thirty. At five twenty thirty. Another 10. 550, that man wants this car. He is focused. He is locked on. No, we are not all done. 570, 560, 570, going once, 570, going twice. But you say 570, 580, 580, get 600,000. Just give 600,000 for it. That's 600,000, 600,000, 600,000. Oh, no, no, no. Sure, just pop it to six, maybe the other guy will go away. 600,000, 610, 610. I'm going to be 10, 10, 10, I'm going to be 10, 10, 10, 20. Another lightly optioned car, believe it or not, the lack of options adds to the credibility and apparently to the price. And I think this is bringing more than the earlier Cuda because it has not been rebodied. This car is carrying all the original sheet metal that it had when it left the factory. Now 640. I'm going to be 30, 40. I'm going to be 30, 40 once. I'm going to be 630, 40 twice. I'm going to be 630, 640, 650. 650. We'll go 660. 660. Yeah, wow. 660. Wow. At 650. 660. Last call. 660. 650 in mid. 660 going once. 660 twice. 660 third and last call. Sold for $650,000. <laughs> it's a big price, but a, a no stories, right, good looking car. Like watching Michael Schumacher after he wins the Formula One Grand Prix. You'd like to see a happy winner. I hope he's on the phone to his wife asking either forgiveness or permission. He's <laughs> oh boy. And with that, we close the bids, the Haggerty Fantasy bids on that 1969 Chevy Corvette L88 Coupe. Now, this could be interesting. The 427 
430 horsepower V8 with four speed. Last of its production run. Fairly low mileage at 31,000. This could be interesting. Thank you for your bids. You know, Bob, these cars were not very well appreciated in the day. Yes, they were the Corvette, but they were the bigger and heavier and, and a little more genteel Corvettes than the mid-year Corvettes, the Stingrays, except when you put the L88 under the hood. So this car now is very well appreciated, but in the day, it had its share of detractors as well as its folks that appreciated it. This is the last of the L88 coupes built in 1969. There were just 206, let's see, 216 produced from 67, 68, and 69, and this is the very last one. And in collector cars, there's something special about owning the very first and the very last. 4,483 Haggerty Fantasy bids. Thank you very much. Something wonderful about an L88 too. They had the deepest, richest rumble. Uh, there's another car, Mike. We were talking about it before. I don't want to pull up next to one of these at the stoplight, hear that rumble, and then have to go against this guy. Wouldn't this be a good match against that Hemi Cuda for a quarter <laughs> mile or so? 185, 180, 180, 190. Pop it a bit, 180, now 90. Pop it a bit, 180, 90. Pop it a bit, 180, 90, 90. The last documented L88 Corvette. There's a sticker on the console that says this car requires a minimum of 99 pump octane. If you get that today, you have to go to Sunoco or VP or Rocket or one of the racing fuel companies. Well, look at this. It's our the gentleman who bought the uh, Camaro ZL1 and the Chevrolet S6. 200,000 to 210. Pop it to 210. Pop it to 210. Pop it to 222. Give me 10. Pop it to 210. Pop it to 210. Going once. Pop it to 210. Going twice. Pop it to 200,000. Give 210. Third and last call. Got it. 220. 220. Pop it to 210. 20. Pop it to 220. Pop it to 220. Pop it to 210. Pop it to 210, 20, once! 220, 215! 215 is bid, 220, Angel! 225, Cliff! 225, 225, once! 225, twice! 225, third and last call! Sold for 220. Oh, when that gentleman decides he wants to win something, he just doesn't Here's let off, does he? He ought to get his own special bow tie. He has picked up some Chevrolet products tonight. Is there a discount for multiple purchases? I don't think so. Welcome back to the 35th Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction here on Speed. There is a beautiful 67 Shelby GT500 fastback just hammered away for, well, not quite yet, actually. We're at 255,000 a climbing. Beautiful car. Nope, that one was. Now I'm confused. It's got a sold sticker on it. I believe, Bob, they had it sold and had to back up. They still had a bidder in. Well, we know it's still going. It'll be sold one way or the other. Tim, you're out. We're at 270. You're out here, sir. The car is sold. We just don't know how much somebody's paid for it yet. You don't normally think of Shelby's in red, but that one was spectacular. Yep, that was a pretty car. And our audience should understand that it's a big, big room. There's a lot going on. The auctioneers make every effort to recognize everybody, keep it all straight. But once in a while, they have to take a breath, back yep. up a half a step, figure out what's going on, and make sure that they know where the bid is and for how much. So it happens now and again. Got it, got it. And now 25. I'm going to get 325. 3,000. I'm going to get 325. Oh, you're right, Mike. It's bringing the money. All in. Hold on. 300 to bid. 25. 310. 310. All in. All done. 300. I'm going to get 10. 10. And. Bits here. 310. 310. 310. Internet. Got it. Now 325. Oh, the internet's getting involved. Phone bidder. 
What did they do before cell phones in this situation? <laughs> they send smoke signals back home? That's why the numbers are a lot higher now. Hold on. 375. Hold on. Hold on. For one in. 375. 75. 375. Got it. Now 400. Let's get four. Let's knock it in. And there are a lot of cell phones being used down there. It just, just isn't done over four hundred thousand dollars. And you're right. It was, it was down the ramp and out the door. We thought it was in the high twos. And we were pleased at that. The old game, high twos, you know. Now four ten. There you go, $410,000. Bob, I've got an email here from uh, Mike in Tucson, Arizona. He says, why does the auctioneer sometimes...